Boston Heights and collect these data, and we actually have things on videotape, and they'll actually come to me and say, Dr. Lu Meng, this child measured as obese, and I, I can't believe it. Look at this video, because this child's not obese. And the child, to my eyes, is obese. And it's, it's reflecting that the frame of all of society has shifted for what is a typical, normal child's body type. And I think our vision for what is normal has shifted heavier, and I think that is the challenge that we have with mothers when we're trying to convince them that there's a problem. Um, the second issue about behavior modification, so agree 100% that one of the most important things to do with obesity prevention is address the entire family. And to be blunt, with our intervention, we don't have enough money to be doing an intervention with the mom and the dad and the teenage siblings and everyone all at once. In an ideal world, one would do it all at once. And I have colleagues who have, some, have submitted some grants to be doing that, a more holistic approach. What we, the angle we took with this is that Mothers, in my experience, are very easily engaged in the idea of, can you teach me how to deal with my child's behavior? I'd love to come to an evening class to do that. They're so engaged in that. And so if we could use that as our hook to get them in, and then in the course of teaching them more about children's emotional and behavioral regulation and parenting and some tricks for their back pocket, that we can also do some obesity prevention messages along with that and see if that combination um, helps. Yeah. So just pick up on what Larry said, and I think you more or less answered it, but mm -hmm. what, what I'm hearing here is that obese children tend to have obese parents. Oh, absolutely. So to repeat, he said obese children tend to have obese parents. So I wish I had the statistic in front of me, but there are some classic studies that show that if um, both of your parents are obese when you are three years old, you are nine times more likely to be obese than if neither parent is obese. But as I think we all appreciate, that is a complex interaction of behavior and biology. So some of it is genetics, some of it is the environment, and some of it is that combination of how genetics drives your behavior, of how you interact with your environment. Just as a quick side note, there are some studies that show that um, biologically, some people are just more likely to turn their head when there's a food cue, meaning that if you're driving down the highway and there's a sign for Grand Traverse Pie Company, you, don't you know people in your life who you drive right by it and they like didn't even notice, didn't notice. I myself, if I'm driving down the highway and there's a sign for Grand Traverse Pie Company, I notice, and I say to myself, I, I don't need pie, and I keep driving. But some people's brains, these most recent research studies show us, really are wired to just look more at the food cues. And is it possible that in those families where both parents are obese, that child got a double whammy for their brain is really wired to look at the food cues? Yep. Yeah? So I, I'll respond real quick, and I'm going to summarize your really awesome comment for the tape. <laughs> and then she was saying that um, if children are growing up in homes with stress and there are changes in their cortisol, that one would presume that the mothers maybe have, or fathers maybe having the same changes in their cortisol, the same eating behaviors related to stress, and the mothers may also be eating the Doritos and the ice cream, with which the child is witnessing, and that environment may also be increasing the child's risk. And I will just respond by saying we are measuring mother's obesity status and we're measuring maternal eating behaviors in a really sensitive way. It's called the Dutch Eating Behavior Questionnaire about whether or not they eat in response to stress. And the other thing we know from the psychology literature is that you can actually do interventions where if you um, teach children how to cope with stress, their cortisol levels will actually change back to normal. And so I think that's what we're hanging our hat on, that if we think, wow, if we can identify this and then we can teach children 
how to cope with stress and perhaps teach the mothers how to cope with stress better? Could you get the whole family unit basically more sort of high functioning and calm and not turning to the Doritos and the ice cream when they've had a stressful day, but finding other ways to address those stressors? Yeah? Um, so again, I'll summarize briefly your great comment. So she, the question was essentially, how might this apply to older school age children beyond this preschool age range, which is a really excellent question. And I, so my training is in child development, and so I am really attuned to this issue that a 21 month old is very different from a 36 month old, is very different from an eight year old, who is very different from a 12 year old. And so as they get older, there are different factors at work. So it's hard for me to sort of summarize the big picture just in a minute, but I would say that number one, the principles we're talking about regarding stress eating and learning to better regulate emotion and behavior, I think those apply at all ages. I think they apply to adults. I think that we feel that if we can get in there really early with young kids, that we can teach these skills to their parents who can then train their children in this sort of thing. Um, the question would be if you went into school age children or adolescents and addressed um, more directly with them their own coping with stress and that sort of thing, might you have some really beneficial effects? Because in that situation, you could actually work directly with the kids and wouldn't be so reliant on working with the children the, or with the parents themselves. Um, I'm actually sitting, sitting over here getting really excited and thinking, oh, we could do that. <laughs> um, the reason why we started with young kid children was primarily because that's where the firmest basis in the research literature was and where a lot of our colleagues had a lot of expertise was in really young children's. And to be honest, and I, I may get a reaction from the room, I think in terms of finding community collaborators, I've found that I've developed very good relationships with Head Starts, and I have found it really challenging to work with school districts for a lot of reasons I totally understand. Um, and so I think that's been one of our issues. Yep. Um, the white states were the ones who they were not even collecting any data. By yeah, choice. by their choice. They just weren't even collecting data. And I think it reflects that this just wasn't even on the radar screen. No one was worried about it. So the states weren't collecting the data. But now every state is collecting the data. Yeah. Yeah? So is there a part of a cortisol and its role in the human body? What it is? Yeah. Um, so the question was to review the role of cortisol in the human body. and. I'm a physician, so I'll, I could pontificate about this for a long time, and I'll try to be brief. So um, people, so cortisol is essential to human life. It's essential to your body functioning. If you don't have any cortisol, you die. And um, uh, so in the hospital, sometimes when people are critically ill, actually, one of the interventions is to give them an injection of cortisol, because cortisol actually produces a cascade throughout your entire body that it, in, it um, affects your immune function, it affects your uh, cardiovascular system, so your blood pressure, your blood vessels, all of that affects um, fat metabolism. It has effects all over the body and affects the way your brain operates. And so knowing that cortisol is, is essential to your functioning in your life, um, we are interested in how cortisol is secreted in your body. And so a normal healthy person has a peak of cortisol in the morning and then it drifts down over the course of the day. And when you don't have that healthy pattern, it raises questions about why do you not have that healthy pattern? What happened that made that pattern go away? Or were you possibly never born with the healthy pattern? We, don't, we haven't gone young enough to figure that out. The other thing is when you experience an acute stressor, um, the, like giving a speech, 
um, your cortisol has a big burst, and that is healthy and normal and exactly what your body should be doing. It actually, I won't be able to articulate it up here, but when your body releases cortisol, it is basically changing blood flow to your gut versus to your heart versus to your brain. And so it changes the way your body is distributing its resources. So it's sort of like the fight or flight response. So you all have heard that um, if, if, if a lion is about to attack you, <laughs> your body has this big physiological reaction where you stop digesting food, you stop thinking logically, and you just run really fast. And so your body is designed to um, be able to respond in the face of danger. And that's driven by hormones, and cortisol is one of them. And so obviously giving a speech is not dangerous, but your body has this fight or flight response with this cortisol release. Um, and think about people who have been in wars, and they have that reaction over and over and over, and eventually the idea is that it just burns itself out. I mean, if your body five times a day or more is having that dramatic cortisol response because a bomb just exploded next to you, eventually you're not gonna mount that response anymore. And PTSD has been associated with this, depression, anxiety, lots of mental health disorders have been associated with changes in cortisol patterns, but then, Last thing, and then I'll stop with the cortisol explanation, is that we also know separate, so that's all psychology research. There's a separate body of researchers um, in a, endocrine, hormone researchers, who um, know that cortisol drives eating behavior. So if anyone in this room has, or has themselves, or had a family member who's had to take prednisone, so prednisone is a steroid that if you have an asthma flare, the doctor prescribes prednisone, um, or if you have some autoimmune disorders, you take prednisone. It just makes your appetite explode, makes you so hungry, because prednisone is um, cortisol, basically. And so when we give patients these medications, we sometimes say to them, this is going to increase your appetite. It's cortisol. Um, so we know that cortisol drives appetite. And so this whole issue of how, gosh, how interesting. Cortisol is part of the stress cascade. Cortisol drives appetite. How could this all be interrelated? And what's been interesting as a researcher is that there's a world of psychology researchers who have been looking at this, and there's a world of um, sort of endocrine researchers who look at it, but people have not brought the two worlds together. And as a big plug for the University of Michigan, you know, I, at the research center I work at, I was walking, I, it was a colleague down the hall, and I said, you know, you're expert in cortisol, I'm expert in obesity, you know, I want to get together and, uh, and try to put these ideas together and apply for a grant, and that's where this all really developed from. <laughs> Same rah rah. <laughs> uh, question? Uh, when you're going to be meeting with public policy officials and tell them you've got this great research project and potentially great results, um, how would you coach those of us that also do that? That we, you know, are we in a no funding state for anything right now? It feels that way. So she just asked me how I would talk to a public policy official about trying to get obesity programming funded <laughs> in a nutshell. And I'll tell you, I think that is extremely, extremely challenging. I, I'll respond in two ways. The practical way um, from my experience now is that the lovely part of this grant from the USDA is that they required that in the fifth year of the grant that you spend the money on disseminating it. So it's a big gift in my mind that after four years, we will see which parts of our intervention worked, and then the plan is to disseminate it to Head Start programs around the state if they're interested, and to disseminate it um, throughout the state using the state extension program. And so there's funding in our grant to be able to do that. It's four years from now. We haven't laid out that precise plan yet, but we could talk. Um, and then in terms of the bigger picture of um, Funding streams for obesity programming, I mean, that is something I can't answer in one minute in that, let's just say, I share your concern. It is a big, big challenge and concern, and the funding issues are so complicated. Yeah? Oh, yeah? Yeah, so um, the question was, are we, we're looking at low income, so all the children in our studies, they are all low income. Her question was, are we also looking at the race dynamic? And so the head starts that we work with tend to be about 60% white, which is not so bad <laughs> in terms of diversity, um, and about f uh, the remainder, there's a big sort of multiracial group, 
And then it's about 25% African American and about, it varies by site, but 5 to 15% Hispanic. Um, the USDA grant that I'm talking about that we're rolling out right now, uh, we're in Grand Rapids. And so the Head Start population there, as I've been told, has a big Hispanic group, which we're really happy about because I think that group, we really need to be working with that group. Yeah? You, you said earlier that working with local school districts is a bit problematic. Can you expand, can you expand on that? <laughs> Uh, so his question was, um, working with local school districts is a bit, has been a bit problematic. And so I'm, I'm going to um, mention to you before I answer that, so without going into a lot of detail, as a researcher, I absolutely know there is a long history of research in this country where people participating in research have experienced abuses, um, the Tuskegee study, like, and so People, I think particularly low-income groups and particularly minority groups, are really suspicious of researchers. And I, I, I could go on and on about this, but I think our group tries really, really hard to make sure that we're on the same plane as the Head Start programs we work with, in that my frame is that the people who direct those Head Start programs, they are our colleagues. Those teachers are professionals. We are not walking in and telling them, here's what you should do. We're working collaboratively with them. And I think it's really important that we send the message that we're not the ivory tower walking in and saying, let me tell you how it's done. Um, and so we try to work really collaboratively. And so I have to say, I don't think it's me. <laughs> I think the issue is that, number one, the school districts, especially now, are really beleaguered and have a lot going on. And number two, in order for something, a research project to go on in a school district, there are layers and layers of bureaucracy in my experience. Probably very appropriate that lots of people on that, uh, in that organization need to approve that. And so what I have found is that when I try to talk to a school district, it actually will take me like a year to get the project approved. Whereas in a Head Start program, they'll take it to their parent advisory board next month and then come back to me and say, it's approved, great, you can get started. So I think that's one of the challenges. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you mean, uh, let me repeat your question. So she was saying that she's aware that there's a relationship between stress and brain development in really young children and infants. Totally agree. And your question was, is it possible there are other, other positive outcomes besides obesity prevention that could result from our approaches? That's your question, right? Um, absolutely, 100% agree that our thought, um, and we're, we're testing all of that. Because our, honestly, if this doesn't work for obesity prevention, but it works to Im improve children's emotional and behavioral regulation, and the parents develop better parenting strategies, it is still a good program. And maybe we would see, OK, well, it didn't change their obesity, but they did eat more vegetables. They did eat less impulsively. They did have less stress eating. Um, and so if we can find that it affects just one part of all of that, we'd be happy that we're making some headway, though ultimately we're focusing on obesity. But yes, I agree completely that hopefully these interventions would do more than just address obesity. And um, again, going back to that cortisol and stress relationship, as you find the test subjects that where it does look like there's the high cortisol, they're eating out, out of stress, will you be documenting the type of stressors such as um, Domestic violence, uh, sexual assault, um, drug use, you know, um, illegal drug use, gang involvement, you know, things like that to try to see what role those play to get cues as to other types of interventions? Excellent question. So her question was um, if we find ultimately that indeed stress is related to cortisol, is related to eating behavior and obesity. Will we, will we be able to disentangle what types of stressors in their lives are related to um, those cortisol changes in eating behavior and obesity? And yes, so we are asking a whole slew of questionnaires related to exposure to violence in the neighborhood. There's a long questionnaire with about 100 items that lists off life events 
And it, it, it's every 100 items. You can imagine I've moved. My house was foreclosed on. A family member went to jail. A family member went to prison. A um, family member had legal involvement. Like, just think, my pet died.